Does the cutting edge nature of tech product management attract you like a magnet attracts metal? Our guest today, CEO and founder of Rocket Blocks, will tell you how to prepare for and land that exciting gig. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me for this, the 332nd episode of Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this podcast. My mission and passion is to help you show that you both stand out in the applicant pool and fit in at your target schools. The result? You get a call one day that's, that causes you to jump up and down shouting, yes, I'm in not only in, but in at the best program for you. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to accept its next MBA webinar, Get Accepted to Chicago Booth, which I will present on Thursday, October 24th. At the webinar, you can acquire a framework that you can use not only for Chicago Booth, but for any top MBA program. Although our focus on the 24th will be actionable tips for this year's Chicago Booth MBA application. So save your spot today at accepted.com slash 332 webinar. I'd like to welcome back to Mission Straight Talk, Kenton Cavestu, who was previously a guest on the Mission Straight Talk in episode 188, a little over two years ago. Kenton graduated from UVA with a bachelor's in economics and history in 2006. Upon graduating, he joined Google in product development and worked there for three years until he moved to Hanover, New Hampshire to attend the Tech School of Business and earn his MBA. He interned at BCG, but returned to mobile product development when he graduated from Tech in 2011. He worked in product management at both Zynga and Flurry following his MBA. For the last several years, he has been full-time CEO of Rocketblocks, which has helped applicants land consulting jobs and has expanded into prepping applicants for product management positions. Since our last interview at exhibit.com slash 188 focused on landing consulting jobs, this show is going to focus on product management in high tech. Kenton, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. It's great to be My back. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now, what are the key qualifications in terms of work experience and qual personal qualities that high tech companies are looking for in product management candidates? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, it is, it's interesting because candidates for product management roles tend to run the gamut. Like uh, people come from very, very different backgrounds. You have some folks that come with uh, like a significant computer science engineering background straight out of undergrad, especially at top institutions like Stanford or MIT or something like that. And then you have people that are, you know, English majors and, and come history from history majors, opposite end, history majors, exactly opposite ends of the spectrum coming into the role. But I think ultimately when you look at what companies, what tech companies want when they're hiring product managers, whether it's Google or Amazon or, you know, Facebook or Stripe or Airbnb, Uber, et cetera, they, they tend to be looking for the same uh, set of skills, regardless of sort of where someone has picked them up. So they want to know that first and foremost, that people have like a true kind of product sense and a passion and excitement around building products. Like if you are going to be a product manager, you need to get excited about like what a product looks like, what it feels like, how users interact with it. And they want to see that you really think about that and think about it deeply. So that's one thing that they really focus on. Another area that is that is critical is uh, some level of technical fluency. So an ability, because in, in you know tech product management, you are working day in day out with um, software engineers to build an actual product. They want to know that you're going to be able to communicate effectively with those team members and. Different companies have different preferences on this. A company like Google or, or Stripe, for example, the payments oriented company, prefer to hire very technical people into the product management role. So they tend to hire a lot of folks that come from an engineering background. Um, however, that has changed over time. And a lot of these companies have realized that uh, just because you have an engineering degree doesn't mean you're gonna make a great product manager. So most companies now look for some baseline of what I like to call technical fluency which basically means that you are going to be capable of working and communicating effectively with software engineers. It doesn't mean you need to be able to write code and almost certainly you will not write production code at whatever company you are working at as a product manager, 
but they do want to know that you'll interact productively with the engineering team. And then the third big bucket is, you know, similar to what a lot of other companies are looking for, whether it's management consulting companies like McKinsey, Bain, et cetera, or other leading companies, just they want people that have strong leadership skills. Um, they want people that know how to work with a team, that know how to collaborate and know how to, to lead a team forward. And so at a very high level, um, I would say that, that those are some of the qualifications they're looking for, regardless of what sort of experience level you're at, whether you're coming out of undergrad, whether you're coming out of a graduate program, or whether you're you know, early, mid-career and switching into product management. Now you obviously, as I you know mentioned, you had a history degree when you started working at Google. Had you prepared yourself by taking uh, programming classes, or yeah, it's, uh, so that's that's a good question. So I basically, you know, product management is another role that in the last like 20 years has really like come into being. Like there were product managers, you know, like. 20 years back and further, but very few, like if you actually did a study of like titles people held, you'd probably find there were, you know, a, a very small amount of product managers 20 years ago. Now it's like a popular role. There's thousands of product managers at a place like Amazon or Google, et cetera. So it's much more popular. When I was applying to Google, uh, I didn't even know what product management was until my last year in college. I, I literally discovered what product management was when I was an intern at another tech company, Electronic Arts, that made games in between my third and fourth year at school. And I was in the marketing department and I had some friends that summer that I was living with that were like, that were PMs at places like Oracle. And they had friends that were product managers at Google. And I learned about what that job was. And I was like, wow, that sounds incredible. I really wanna go do that. But I, I just, I didn't even realize it existed. Uh, until then. So I got back to school fourth year at UVA and I was an economics and history major and I basically learned that summer that Google did hire these people called product managers. Their job sounded incredible. Um, I did not, uh, but basically I learned that to, to get that type of job, especially at that time, Google basically wanted people that had computer science degrees, which I did not. So I looked into whether I could actually get a CS degree, add a CS degree my fourth year at UVA. And even if I took all computer science classes, like a whole year, it wasn't feasible. Um, so I was a little bummed about that, but I started trying to figure out, are there other ways to, to, to make that transition? And I found someone, I was actually really lucky. I had a friend at, at uh, University of Virginia whose older sister was a, one of the few kind of early PMs at Google. And she, she basically said, look, like if you don't have a CS degree, it's like a non-starter to even get into the interviews at this time. Uh, so what you can do is you can look at some other teams that hire people that don't have CS degrees, but do product work. And if you get into one of those teams, you might be able to shift, but you're gonna have to kind of get your foot in the door first and do that. So that's, that's actually what I ended up doing. Um, so I joined a more kind of operations focused team initially, did that uh, for my first like three to four months at Google and eventually transitioned into a product group. I see. And, and what was so exciting about the product management role to you? Yeah, that's a good question. I think product management was really appealing because it has, it, it felt like it had a really good mix of skill sets that you got to apply and also that you really, um, you, you got to see and help something develop from the concept stage all the way through you know, building it, launching it, iterating it. And so it was this full life cycle experience that seemed really compelling where at the beginning you might be thinking a lot about, okay, what, what is the, the reason for this product being? Like, why would we build this? What, it, you know, what customers would it serve? Like, what is like, a strategic discussion around why would you even do something? And then, you know, on the other side of the life cycle, you might be like tactically analyzing user engagement metrics, numbers, um, seeing how people are actually interacting with their product, talking to customers who are using it. And, and that's a totally different type of work, but the opportunity to kind of play across that whole life cycle, I found very compelling. I think I also sort of had this inkling even even coming out of undergrad that at some point I would like to run my own business. And you know, I, I never heard of this role of product management, as I mentioned, until I was a fourth year. But when I did, I was like, oh, this 
you know, it's not running your own business per se, you still work for another company, but it felt like it had more aspects of that than any other role I'd seen. So I thought, I think that was also very, uh, very appealing for me. Right. And all right, so so you managed to get in with the the history background. What kind of education do you recommend for product man management in high tech companies? Yeah, I think so. Good question. There's a bunch of different routes that are feasible. I, I think uh, an MBA I think is a very good route, especially for particular companies. Like there are certain leading tech companies that like have a strong preference for product managers with an MBA. Amazon is is the the most salient example. They love hiring product managers from MBA schools. I think they're the largest hirer of MBAs uh, in the U.S. at least now. Um, I know certainly some schools that started. Like, I think Ross, they're the biggest employer. Yeah, Ross for sure. But I, right. it, like more schools that I've talked to, the same same thing is happening. Um, and so I, I think that can be a great route, uh, especially if you are coming to product management and you don't have, say, a technical background, which is another very strong route. Like if you're a uh, mechanical engineer, computer science, electrical engineering in undergrad, that technical basis of like how things fit together, how how a product works and, and actually technically functions, companies like hiring those type of folks as well because especially early in career, it's like, well, they know how a product could fit together and hopefully we can teach them the other stuff around the job, like the product strategy, understanding user needs, et cetera. The flip side for like the folks that come out of an MBA and why that's good is they tend to come with the broader business perspective. What are the consumer needs? What would actually sell? How would we price it? How could we position it? How could we distribute it? How could we market it? All those things. MBAs tend to have a very good background for that. Those are probably like if you're like in terms of coming out of a particular career transition point, coming out of an MBA or coming out of a technical undergrad or master's program is probably the best way to get into it. But quite frankly, the majority of people probably get into product management from what using kind of like what I call like the foot in the door strategy, like similar to like what I did early on, which is like you, you take a role somewhere that gives you some exposure to it. You build your credibility within that organization that shows that you have interest in that type of work. You start taking on little pieces of it, helping people. And then you make the transition within a company. And uh, there is probably, I would say it's the majority of product managers I know got into the role that way. So they might learn they have an interest at a certain stage. Like maybe they learn in undergrad, they have an interest like I did. Maybe they learn in an MBA program that got an interest. But if they can't make that transition like directly, they take some other role and, and you know eventually kind of work their way into it. Marketing or operational role. Yeah. And then they yeah, and in particular, so there's this concept of that I think Google really popularized and like, you know, the organization around how you ship a software product. And at Google, these were called core teams. And so a core team was um, led by, not necessarily led, but you'd have like a PM who was working, you know, had a core team around building a particular product. And the other key stakeholders in that team would be have some lead engineer that you'd be working with. There was usually a lead product marketing manager, so a PMM, uh, a lead designer who was you know, in charge of the interface and making sure that everything looked as it, as it should. And then depending on how big the project was and the scope of it, you might have you know, like copywriters involved, you might have specific user researchers, um, and then ops, like ops supports and sales leads. So that kind of like you have these leads from these different functions on a core team. And so you could come at product management from a lot of different ways. You could get exposure by say being a, a marketing person on a core team or even a sales or an ops person on a core team. And so like that was my particular, like I was operationally focused, but got to work on some of those core teams and that was what gave me the exposure, I got to meet PMs, I got to like, you know, express, build relationships with them, express my interest in it. And especially at any fast growing tech company, there's always more work to go around than, than anyone can get done. And so if you build some credibility and express interest uh, to a PM that you know, there's, there's often a good chance at some point he or she will reach out and say, hey, can you help with X? Um, you know, I, I need some help on this, I don't have the bandwidth. Um, 
And so that's a great way to, to bridge that gap. Now, so you've talked about kind of almost the back door, if you will, into product management positions, correct? It sounds like a very effective route. What if a company is advertising, we need a product manager, whether it's Amazon or Google or, or you know, any of them, Facebook, whatever it is, what is the hiring process typically like for product management positions? Yeah, good question. So almost always it's a two round process. Sometimes it goes further. It will typically start with, let, let's talk, let's start talking about like the bigger companies, like the Amazons, Googles, Facebooks. They'll start, I guess you could say it's like a three round process. They'll start with like a phone screen, almost always will happen with a recruiter. So someone in the recruiting organization, not someone that's going to live within the product management kind of, you know, stack. And they will basically screen candidates for, um, do I think this person is a credible fit for the organization? So the, the lens they're kind of looking through is, do they seem to have the right type of experiences on their resume? Uh, when I speak to them, do I, do I like them and do they fit like whatever the company culture is there? And if I pass this person on to the next round, so if I, like this recruiter is thinking, you know, if I send Kenton to Adam, who's a PM and Adam does the first round interview, is Adam going to come back and say like that was a terrible candidate or like that was a credible candidate he done, he you know had some interesting things but he wasn't a fit or like yeah that was a great candidate so that's really what the recruiter is doing like make sure you seem like a culture fit and make sure you seem like a credible candidate which is basically like do you have some of the right signals on your resume and when I the recruiter ask you about those signals do, do you seem to be able to like credibly explain them in a competent way so that's like round one round two Typically, at you know Facebook, Amazon, Google, pretty similar, um, is usually two phone interviews. Sometimes they're video conference interviews. Sort of depends on the company, the team, you know where you are physically, even sometimes. And those two interviews will be more content focused. Um, so at Amazon, they'll test you on the leadership principles, which is kind of their lens of testing you on various skills that they're looking for, but you know, they will essentially end up being like product oriented conversations where they'll test you on and for Amazon and be like leadership principles that are relevant to building products. Like, do you, do you think big about vision? Um, do you have good natural intuition? Like Amazon has this leadership principle that's called R right a lot. So they will try and test your intuition on various things and see if you have good kind of product intuition. Um, those are usually like two 45 minute to an hour long interviews. Um, they're almost always with PMs specifically. Sometimes, depending on the company, you might like do one interview with like a PM, one interview with an engineer who might be a little more focused on trying to suss out, do I think this person is like technically fluent enough to work on this team? So they're probably not gonna grill you on like a Maybe they'll go through a product case with you, but they might just try and ask you questions to understand how is this person, how is he or she going to interact with engineers on our mm -hmm. team. Um, so after that round, then there's basically an on-site round, which is depending on the company, maybe four interviews, maybe as many as six interviews. And the biggest difference between that, uh, like phone round, video conference round of interviews and this round of interviews is that you usually for a product management role, we'll get a spectrum of different folks that you talk to. So you'll get that kind of glance across the core team. So usually you'll talk to maybe another PM or maybe two more PMs, but you'll also talk to maybe another engineer or a lead designer um, or potentially someone from a sales team, people that are gonna try and evaluate uh, how you're gonna interface with those different functions that are really critical. And you know the PMs, will basically test you on going back to those things we were talking about at the beginning, like your product sense, product strategy. They might test you a little bit on like, can you back that type of stuff up with like analytics and metrics? Like do you handle numbers and analysis well? Uh, engineers, again, sorry, technical go ahead. Skills. Technical yeah, skills. Engineers will test you on your technical skills and maybe test you on some product sense and culture fit. And you know, designers, sales, copywriters, et cetera, whoever else, you, operations folks will probably try and just sense a culture fit. Does he or she fit with this company? 
and you know be a little bit maybe do they understand kind of where where would they where and how would they interact with my function do they understand what design is about do they understand uh, like the operations that might go into supporting Amazon core shopping experience or Google AdWords or you know, Facebook's newsfeed. You've used the term several times, product sense. Can you can you say say what that is? Yeah, I mean it's or give an it, example. Is, it is tough to define, but I think you can think about like some of these questions you'll get. Like someone will say, you know, tell me about like why Google has what do you think Google's strategy is for chat applications and messaging applications? And that might be a, like a like a more it's product strategy, but it's also kind of like what is their business strategy there? Product sense tends to be like a product oriented question where they really want to suss out does this person like like building and thinking about products? Like, do they think about them in a certain almost intuitive way? Like, if you put a product in front of them, do they not just like understand who the consumer is and whatnot, but like how do they react to like the design of it, like what colors are used, how is that going to make people feel? Are there too many buttons, not enough buttons? Is it clear what to do? Like, do they have like this almost like spidey sense around like what a good product is and what it looks like and feels Probably like? Steve, Steve Jobs was famous for that, right? Yeah, yeah. Steve Jobs is like the, the pinnacle of, of product sense, like so good, right, that he doesn't have to ask anyone, what, you know, famously, he said like customer research is for idiots or what. <laughs> like, I know what the customers want. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you know, there are some good PMs that are like that, but that is he's he's by far, he's like the quintessential example of that. Yeah. It's a different um, league. You know, a company like Amazon and like Bezos style of leadership is is probably like on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. It's just like ask customers what they want, figure out what they want, give them what they want, who cares what it looks like. Like, you know, if you compare like Amazon UI to like Apple UI, totally different. Right. They both work, right? But that's very true. Different. But very different. Very, very yeah. different. Yeah. What do you think is the key to successfully navigating this hiring process, other than what we've already discussed in terms of education, experience, and, and qualities? And um, it might differ by, by companies. And let's, let's, you know, obviously different companies, but is there a difference between, let's say, more established high-tech companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, et cetera, and brand new startups? Yeah, there, there definitely is. I think one of the biggest things, aside from demonstrating those core skills that we were talking about, are the, the level of industry-specific and sort of product-specific knowledge that different companies want to see. Uh, is quite varied and you can sort of at a high level think about it on a scale like the Googles, Amazons, Facebooks of the world, they essentially are hiring generalists. Like we want to be able to hire you as a PM, we'll put you on whatever product we need you, you'll kind of rotate around yada yada yada, maybe they'll end up specializing in something or finding a really good fit. But if you're interviewing at a smaller company like, and it's you know not a tiny company, but imagine something like Stripe or even Airbnb, um, so pretty big. Companies, but like you can't show up to an Airbnb interview as a PM and have say not much interest in the travel space um, or like hotels and lodging because it's so core to the only thing they do right. that it would be a real red flag for them. Whereas you could show up to a Google product management interview and you know like and use Google products but not know what a lot about everything there because they're in so much varied stuff like they're in basically most industries that exist in a way um whereas you know airbnb is not and think about like a small startup out of y combinator like they're just trying to survive they're like focused on probably one very specific problem uh, if you have no interest in that space you don't seem to know anything about the industry you don't know anything about that company's products that's going to be like a massive red flag so i think that's one of the biggest things that change like the level of interview specific kind of research and industry specific research you need to do goes up the smaller the company gets. That makes sense. They don't, they don't want to, they want you to have some knowledge when you get there. They don't have the time or the resources to train you. Yeah, exactly. Like Google can train, like if you got all the fundamentals, they can train you, you know, you don't know a ton about ads, they'll train you ad, on ads when you get that. Like, you know, Stripe, like they don't want to train you on like what payment processing is. They want you to have something. 
you know, they'll, they'll probably train you a lot. You'll learn a lot more when you get there, I'm sure, but they don't want someone that has, you know, zero idea. What kind of interviews can a job applicant expect for product management positions? Will there be team interviews? Will there be technical interviews, more general interviews? What, what, what can they expect? I think you see maybe three, three types of interviews in product management. Um, the first is, is like a product case interview. So it's similar to what they do in consulting but the orientation and the depth of the case is maybe more around like building, launching a specific product and how you would work through that versus like, uh, you know, just a high level strategy, business strategy problem. So it might be like, hey, you know, we're thinking about like, uh, Lyft is thinking about launching scooters in the Austin market. They've never done it before. They've only done cars there. Like, tell us how you would like, build the product, what needs to change in the mobile app, what needs to change across the board, how would you launch it, all this stuff. Um, so that's the, that's the first one, product case interview. The second interview, uh, second type of interview is like a, a pretty typical, I would say like fit interview where they're trying to suss out some of the, the fuzzier skill sets that they want, like leadership, your ability to collaborate, your communication skills. They might just ask you a lot of questions like, tell us about a time, a lot of behavioral kind of fit oriented questions. And then the third type of interview type you often see is um, basically what I look like, it's, it's like a mix. It's like a hybrid of a little bit of like some fit questions and what I'll call like mini product questions. So like maybe like, let's ask you, you know, oh, what's your favorite mobile app? And you'll give some answers. They'll say, okay, tell me about like why it's your favorite mobile app. Like, tell me three features you'd like to build in it. What's the worst thing about it? So it's not like a full-blown product case. They're not they're not going to bring out charts because they don't know what your favorite mobile app or is any data. But they just kind of want to test you lightly on that. And then in the similar vein, they so they might ask you that question. You spend five minutes on it, and then they might ask you, okay, like tell me about like if. Um, you know, you were gonna build X type products, like what type of information would you like log to the database? What would you wanna store? And what analysis would that allow you to do? So like testing like a little bit of like technical ability and some analytical sense, but it's just kind of these point questions rather than one continuous products. And then they might switch to like a fit question, like why do you wanna be at Google? Or, you know, if it's Amazon, like tell me about uh, a time you you know made like a difficult decision with a coworker and you like you disagreed and committed, which is like another Amazon principle that they care about a lot. What are the most common mistakes that wannabe product managers make in the application process in general, the hiring process, and in the interviews specifically? <laughs> uh, good question. A lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, Let's, let's start with like in the, in the recruiting process, I think probably the biggest thing that I think folks miss is a product manager is when you're looking at like a resume and you're screening or someone reaches out and expresses interest in a particular role. Um, I think the biggest thing, especially if you haven't been a product manager for what, what is often the first question that someone's going to be asking themselves is like, is this person going to be able to navigate like the weird vagaries and challenges that come up through going through this whole life cycle, product strategy, thinking high level to like super tactical execution stuff. Cause it's a really weird mix. Like people that are great at product strategy are not often really great at like jumping into a support queue and answering a customer support email. Cause like that's, what needs to be done to like make the team and the product successful at that point. Um, and one of the things that is a very good indicator that a person might at least jet, you know, have some of that range is that they've gone through that process before, no matter what it is. So like if they have like conceived of some idea, put it out there in the wild and like improved upon it. And that could be, you know, if it's someone that's like, not coming from a traditional technical background, that might be like an event they created, they ran, it worked, they iterated on it, they did it year after year, like for philanthropy. Or it could be like, hey, like, yeah, I'm not technical, but I like started this like side project and here's what it is and I put it out in the wild and we iterated on it. 
it's, it's seeing that process somewhere in the resume. And a lot of times what you'll end up seeing in a resume is like someone that comes at, you know, the job from like a super technical background and they've done a bunch of technicals. It's very clear from the resume, okay, like this person is great technically, but you don't see any sort of end to end stuff. And you're like, well, I don't know. Like, and, and if you had to interview one, only one person and you see another resume that's got like someone going across that spectrum, for me, and I think a lot of other product managers, you gravitate towards someone who's tried to like go through that cycle. Um, because it's just like, once you've gone through that cycle and something, you understand kind of the messy realities of like how something comes to life. Um, so that's in the, in the like the resume screen stage, I would say that's the biggest mistake. Like just someone trying to go prove super deep ability on like technical sense or like, yeah, I've done like, um, uh, like I'm really good analytically and like all these analyses, but like no idea of like, well, what came before that, what came after that, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of taking away from this that the product manager needs both to have vision and kind of a strategic piece. And at the same time, have the, the detail orientation to get down into the D to, to the weeds rather and, and implement. And it's this balance of this ability to, to kind of go both directions that's distinctive about the product manager. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very fair summary. And and getting back to my question about mistakes, the mistake would be not presenting both par both parts of the equation. Yeah, I, it, and it, yeah, exactly. It, it is totally fine and expected that people are going to have various strengths where they go sure. deep in a certain area, but not showing that you can kind of play across that spectrum, I think, is is something people miss. Okay. Now, could you touch on some of the differences in hiring and again, what they look for, for the, you know, the largest high tech firms and I'll, I'll pick on the, the FANG firms, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Yep. Yeah. So a few big differences in terms of just product managers across those companies. Okay. Yeah. Um, Google, of, certainly of the big three, Google, Amazon, Facebook has the most technical bias in their process. Like, um, historically, all their PMs. Most geeky. <laughs> years, yeah, the, the founders, uh, founders and early CEO, all engineers. So like that, the kind of practice and mindset came from, you know, it's all technical driven. What we do is very technical. Anyone who's working with the engineers needs to be technical. And they had an experience where the very first PM they hired, I can't remember who it was, but what they hired, they were told that like PMs didn't need to be engineers and since they hired a non-engineer as a PM and that particular person did not work out and slowed, they felt it slowed down the team. And so the lesson they learned from that was like, that's bad. And they've since kind of rolled off of that, but the bias is still there. Like that stuff gets baked into the culture. Um, so they have the most technical bent, I would say. Facebook, uh, used to care more about the technical stuff and then actually publicly came out and said like this, this is not a key requirement like our most successful product managers are not the most technical um, many times they come from a background that's totally un, you know non-technical uh, but they have a very strong they probably have the strongest bias of hiring former like people that have an entrepreneurial streak so I, I think of all the companies I we are talking about here and what I was just mentioning like the the, the firm that probably pays the most attention, like if you don't have a demonstrated that range, the, like the, you're least likely probably in my opinion to get a job at Facebook. Like they like people that are really entrepreneurial that have done that type of stuff before because they feel it's the strongest signal that this person is gonna be able to do every whatever is required within Facebook to make a particular product work. Amazon, I would say is the most MBA friendly as we talked about of of the large tech companies, they, I think, approach a lot of problems, reasonably so, given given Bezos's background and how he likes to operate. From what is the business opportunity? Is there a real market here? How can we approach it? And then other things kind of, you know, fit in below that. Where where Google almost, in many cases, on the opposite side is like, we have this incredible new technology. What do we do with it? How can we apply it in many different places? Like if you look at Google's current product strategy and like for the, the next decade, you know, a lot of it will be around how do we take our strength in AI and machine learning 
and bake it into every product we have to make those better. That is a that is a strategy that comes squarely out of like, here's a technology we have, let's go apply it everywhere in all our products and make things better. Whereas and Amazon the out there, what's that? And it reflects the engineering background. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And why they care about that. And Amazon's out there just like, hey, we're you know a bookstore and now we've got a movie site and uh, also we do infrastructure for startups uh, and other people because they're, they basically look around and they're like, yeah, there's a market here. We, we can make something work. And I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but at a high level, I think that's where it comes from. The last one I'll touch on a little bit because I do think they have some unique aspects is, well, maybe I'll touch on two more, but Netflix, not just in product management, kind of across the board, has this bias against a little bit of a bias against newer talent, basically. Like they, they generally hire folks that have already got industry experience in whatever role. Um, and, and they have basically said that they think it leads to like a more mature, more competent uh, talent base that doesn't need to, they don't need to spend as much time training. So probably the biggest difference there is that um, from, you know, like Google or Facebook, which hire a lot of people like right out of undergrad, um, is Netflix has a bias for people with more industry experience. And then I think the other flavor that is worth mentioning is Apple. company like Airbnb or maybe, um, maybe you could put Slack in this bucket. Um, but some of these newer consumer focused startups that Slack have- Slack is actually business to business. Well, yeah, so that's true. That's a good point. Um, they are, uh, so I would clarify that as they are like a B2B company that maybe is at the leading edge of like the consumerization of B2B. And what I mean by that is the product quality that they're delivering to an enterprise is basically a consumer quality product in like fit and finish. Um, and this is a big trend that you're seeing in enterprise startups, like the, the software that they're using is getting much, much better and more intuitive. Um, but companies like that tend to also care a lot that that PMs have um, a strong kind of a stronger like design sense and understanding of making a product that looks and feels intuitive and is going to be easy. I was thinking that's also true of Apple, isn't it? Yes, Apple is an interesting case though because they they do hire product managers now. Um, for a long time, Apple did not have the role of product management. It did not exist at Apple. And what they did was, uh, going back to this concept of a core team that we were talking about, you know, if you think about a core team uh, loosely, you can kind of think about it on a spectrum. There's the people building the product, and there's the people like selling and marketing the product. And a PM is somewhere, they're like a hub in the middle trying to coordinate all that stuff. And that is really like what, what the role looks like at Google and Microsoft and Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. Um, Apple historically said, yeah, we get that. But like at the end of the day, like there's some people building the product and there's some people selling the product. So what is the PM really doing? Why don't we just have engineering managers and marketing managers? And that's what they did for a long time. Um, only and only recently um, have they had uh, product managers, a true product okay. manager. And, and that started to happen more as they're building a little more software. Like famously, Apple is a, is a hardware company. That's where their roots are. And um, that's how they operated. And you, you, like, if you think about the role of product management, because of you know what you pointed out earlier, it's it's the spectrum. Yeah. Apple's role is basically like there. It's hard to find people that are actually really good at both. So just get a really good engineering manager to cover that end of the spectrum, and get a really good marketing manager for the other end of the spectrum. That is interesting. All right, let's let's turn to Rocket Blocks. What is Rocket Blocks, and how can it help someone? get a product management position? Yeah, so Rocketblocks is basically a platform that helps candidates build and hone the skills they need to succeed in job interviews. We started off with, with management consulting. Our second vertical is for product management. And the philosophy is exactly the same. We try and take the skills that these companies are testing for, whether it's things like product sense, uh, technical fluency, analytical ability, um, you know, kind of like your communication and collaboration style and build drills around them that then allow a student to come in online, practice those particular skills 
And then we've got embedded concept reviews if you're struggling with a particular skill. But the whole idea is to be basically a digital gym for preparing for your interviews. So exercise, practice. Exactly. Exercise is good. And is it is it mostly, it's not, obviously it's not one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's, it's videos, workshops, workbooks. How does yeah, it, how, more, how more does than it work? Say the driving force is to, there are some, there's some videos in the in the platform but it's it's like interactive drill so here's like a interview scenario how would you react to this put in your answers here sometimes we make you you know if it might sometimes we'll in the product management thing it might be like here prioritize a roadmap and so we'll give you like 10 features and you have to pick the three best based off the scenario so you're dragging boxes around other times it might be like look at this look at these user interfaces here's two different competing user interfaces here's the scenario here compare what, what these against each other what sticks out, what's good, what's not. Um, so it depends a little bit on the question, but the idea is all kind of organic to the scenarios you face in the interview on the job, and it is interactive. It's a solo experience. Um, that's the, kind of the core of what we do. We do offer, we do facilitate a market of expert coaches that if you want to sit down with someone who can run you through a one hour mock interview for, for product management or on the consulting side as well. Um, we vet and curate a list of experts that are available in the rocket block system and you can book them. So that's, Got you it. know, that's, that's optional. The core that's, of real That's an extra. Exactly. This is the solo drills. Now is it, is the core product, let's say, you know, you go through the workbook, workbook or whatever are the, are the mock interview components. Is that something that is, is videotaped and somebody provides feedback or, or is there some kind of automatic feedback on the, on the videotaped interview? Yeah, so that's a, we, there's not like automatic feedback. So basically when you're going through and doing any of these drills, if the drill is positioned in such a way where there's an objective answer, which in many cases there are, especially for like an analytical question, um, after you have done your work and submitted your answer, you will see, you know, whether you got it right or wrong, and you'll see an explanation that comes from a rocket blocks expert who's someone in the product management side who worked at Google, Amazon, or Facebook say, here's how I solved it. Here's the explanation. Here's how you get to that right answer. Um, for more subjective stuff, like evaluating, say a series of wireframes and user designs, right. Uh, We'll, we'll again show you, you know, you'll enter in your answer and then you'll get to compare your answer to an answer from an expert that works in one of those companies. So it's not a grading of your answer necessarily. There's a little bit of, you know, you have to look at it and say, okay, did I really meet that bar or not? And, and what about interview prep itself? Um, I mean, is there any interview like uh, either using like AI to, to sorry? Like sitting down yeah. live with another person. Yeah, yeah. Like, like you and I are doing right now. Or yeah. or is it or has the technology gotten to a point where where technology can say you're not maintaining eye contact, okay, with the camera or you know something like that. Yeah. I don't think it could. I don't think it's say your your handshake isn't firm enough. But um, you know, yeah. is there? Any, uh, yeah. So I, I think that stuff is important. We we don't really focus on it today. I mean, through certainly like if you do a if you book an expert and do a live mock interview, they're going to give you feedback on right. the cadence, eye contact, things like that, especially if you ask, ask for that. Um, but a lot of the solo experience is focused on you getting the, the core mechanics of the skills down, like you being able to, uh, you know, understand what a product sense question is getting at and deliver a good answer. The content, Last, like, the substance. Look on the screen as you are, right. which is important. And I think if, if you are a student and you are working on that aspect, by all means, I don't want to say that is not important. Right. Um, where our platform can help you do that is by booking an expert or right. we have an additional, there's baked into the product that everyone just has access to. You can find a peer that's also preparing for interviews. And so you and I could sit down, we'd find each other in the peer marketplace, schedule an interview session. I'd give you an interview. You give me an interview, we give each other feedback, and that's another way you can get that live practice. So we help facilitate that as well. And is Racket Blocks like a, a course and a set fee, or is it a subscription model where the user pays per month? How does it work? It's the latter. So it's a subscription model. Again, I think best best comparison is think about it like a gym. Um, so you can pay $35 a month, um, depending on, you know, 30. you could pick the consulting product or the product management product. 
and you use it, you know, as long as you need to prepare. And did I see on your site that some schools have, uh, have engaged with Rocket Blocks to prepare their students? Yes. Yeah, we do have a lot of um, university partners. So a good chunk of our user base, you know, comes directly through those. So we have you know, a lot of the leading MBA schools, um, folks like Stanford uh, on the West Coast, Berkeley, um, Yale, Cornell um, on the East Coast, and a bunch of folks in Europe and, and Asia as well. Wow. Oh, impressive. Uh, what are your plans for Rocket Blocks going forward? Well, so there's a, <laughs> that's a good question. There's a ton of stuff we want to do. Um, we are always adding and curating the existing kind of drills in the platform, which are you know critical for us of providing like a realistic scenarios that you can practice on and get better at your interviews. So there's a lot of stuff we're doing there. Um, you know, did, eventually we're going to add some new verticals. So you know, in addition to consulting and product management, we'll have a third vertical. Um, not in the immediate future, but it is you know something that we're working on and doing taking some of the initial steps now. And then I think a lot of you know other kind of development and work that we'll do is really around just kind of refining and going deeper on the type of content and how you interact with that content in the system today. Because I think the core of what's there we found is is really helpful for students, but we know that we can even, you know, there's features that we can add and ways that we can augment that content to go really deep for students. And we think that will provide an even better experience. And of course, as technology changes and improves, that again gives you more, more avenues for exactly. improving. Right. Exactly. Like when we started, you know, we started in 2011, it was, it was really hard to provide a pretty good mobile experience um, consistently across tablets and, and mobile devices where you're you know, RocketBlocks forces you to enter a lot of information because we're giving you an interview scenario and saying, you know, tell us how you structure this problem or like, you know, give us like the four insights from this chart, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, it was tough to do that well on mobile. Now that technology has gotten a lot better, we actually recently just did another refresh um, of our mobile experience. And it's, you know, it, it's a little bit different than the desktop experience, but it, it feels good on a mobile phone. Like you can actually be in a Starbucks and practice some drills or, you know, get in some mental math practice or on a train somewhere. Um, and that's important to us because, you know, everyone's busy these days and getting, getting practice in on the go is important. Um, and the technology has just gotten a lot better in the last decade. That's great. Now let's, it's, it's now about eight years since you earned your MBA at Tuck. How has your perspective on that experience <clears throat> evolved? And are you still glad you did it? Because when we spoke two years ago, you were. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that the high level answer is still the same. I think that I was just actually talking about this yesterday with a, uh, someone who's a current student at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I think you recognize and kind of the, the value of the network seems to just compound over time. And so I think that's the biggest thing um, as your classmates progress in their careers and do all sorts of interesting and impressive things It like the amount of like great people you have access to and that can help you out in various scenarios, I think is really incredible. Great. What do you, what do you wish I would have asked you? Um, an interesting question may have been like, what is the most interesting question you've ever heard of in a product management interview? Go for it. So the best one I've heard of recently is uh, a Google PM that used to uh, walk into the interviews with a duffel bag full of physical products, various things. Sorry, my Google now just got activated by me saying Google. Um, and the candidate would have to reach into this bag, pull out some item at random, and then critique that product. Uh, and talk about what are the deficiencies of that product? How could you make that product better? What would their marketing strategy be for that product? Um, and so a really, I think, unique, interesting way of testing product sense uh, in, in an in a, in a avenue that you wouldn't expect. Like you'd probably expect to be asked about a software product, um, but it really takes you a little bit out of the comfort zone, physical products, different worlds, also a little kind of intimidating probably you know, someone walking into an interview with a massive duffel bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. I've, t I've told this before. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting um, interview story having nothing to do with product management. 
happened to my son. My son was going for his uh, first uh, all-day interview for a full-time job. Okay. And he was interested. Obviously, he was interested. wouldn't have gone. But he was there and, you know, he was meeting the first person, and then they were going to give him a technical test. He's a, a software developer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, the guy's about to hand him the exam, and he says to him, you know, I just want to let you know, normally I would turn off my phone during an interview, but my wife is expecting, and I will take a call if she, if she calls me. <laughs> so he, I said, okay, fine. No problem. Here's your exam. Boom. The phone went off. It was his mother-in-law that she was driving to the hospital. His wife was in labor and she gave birth that day. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the company uh, understood, was very, very reasonable about it. And he came back and then they asked him to do like a PowerPoint um, the next time he came back. And he did it. And the last picture was, of course, a picture of the baby. <laughs> but, um, yeah, awesome. that was that was a, one of the better interview stories, job interview stories I've, I've heard. And it That's and my son. So anyways, Kenton, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate your sharing your knowledge of tech product management. Obviously, it's vast, as well as of uh, Rocketblocks and its interview prep tool. It's, it's basically hiring guidance. Where can listeners learn more about Rocketblocks or try it out? Yep. Um, pretty simple. Just go to Rocketblocks, the word rocket and the word blocks, jam together, dot M-E. And you'll find the consulting stuff there and the product management stuff as well. Okay. Now we're going to, thanks, thanks again. We're going to link to Rocket Blocks and related podcasts and articles, including our previous interview with Kenton on consulting interviews and how Rocket Blocks can help with those, as well as information about the Tech MBA program, all from the show notes at exhibit.com slash 332. And a quick reminder, don't miss the upcoming Get Accepted to Chicago booth webinar. Reserve your seat now by registering at exhibit.com slash 332 webinar. Listener, thank you too for tuning in to this, our 332nd episode. If you're concerned that you missed something in today's show or wanted to take a note or two but couldn't because you were driving, jogging, cooking, or doing whatever you were doing, don't worry, we've done it for you. You'll find the show notes at as I mentioned, accepted.com slash 332. This is Admissions Trade Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.